Still posting. Here we go. I think we're live. Hi, everyone. I'm Scott Lewis. This is your virtual par start party for the 30th of June, 2013. I'm your host, Fraser Kane. My trusty co-host is at a wedding. So um, we're flying solo tonight. And with me, we have the other bald man in a green shirt, Corey Smith. And Corey, you're out of Iowa, yeah? Yes. Nice. And our tried and true Gary Canella. How you doing, Gary? Hi, guys. And he's actually about 15 minutes away from me, 15 minute drive. So. Okay, yeah. yeah. Now, a little bit further north than me is Stuart Foreman up in the San Francisco area. Hello. I'm still waiting for dark, so... I'm, Can someone speed up the spin of the earth, please? I know. That would be great. Well, Gary and I were talking. It's like he must be more west than I am. So we checked our longitude, and he's actually five degrees more west than I am. <laughs> and he's also farther south, so that's why he gets darker right. sooner than sooner than me. So I'm yeah. going to go off frame here and do my stuff. I'll probably be back in about ten minutes or so. Awesome. And I believe Corey's going to be doing the same um, since so both Corey and Stuart are going to be imaging off-site and transferring their files via SD card to be able to share with us. So Gary and I will be with you tonight. I know Thad is just got moved to a new house, so we're going to be having a lot of fun tonight um, just looking at our favorites. Um, as we're going forward, too, if you want to make any comments, please feel free to leave them on the event page on Google+, Plus, also over on YouTube. I'll be monitoring our Twitter handle as well, which is the, or the, underscore VSP. And we're also on Facebook. I'll try to keep uh, going with all the comments going on, but the best way for me to be able to read all of them is if you either use my, the Google Plus event or on the YouTube stream, because I will see them right here in my Hangout window. Scott, so, do you want me to share... Uh just leave something on the screen that I imaged in the last couple of nights? Yeah, make something pretty. Oh, show, me, show me something okay. pretty, Corey. All right. You, yeah, okay. I'll do what I can. All right. And I know, Gary, you had something up here earlier. What did? Yep. What were you imaging yeah, let me, earlier? Let me pop that up. This is uh, the things everybody's been asking for since they went away last year. Oh, I think I know what this is. And this is the eagle. Yes. It, Finally coming into view. I've got a lot of light down here. Um, it's pretty, it's still pretty low on the horizon. So we're about on the on the horizon. Is that for you? Um, I'm probably fifteen, maybe twenty degrees. Okay, yeah. So it's pretty low for you. Mm -hmm. It's just above the trees. It's just cleared the trees. So all that neat summer stuff is coming into view. And here's the uh, pillars of creation. Very nice. I always love this guy. And this is in, um, again, hydrogen alpha light. And this particular one is uh, two minutes, and it's been two by two. Okay. So is it two, you, know, two, you took two minutes to collect those photons in there, but you also changed the density of the photons reading it, or the, of your CCD, right? Right. So, so two by two. taking every four, um, what am I trying to say, pixels. And making them one. Nice. So yeah, this is Messier's sixteenth object going on there, and it's it's got the it, and it's the Eagle Nebula. And I think if the way I'm looking at it, if I turn my head counterclockwise, maybe ninety to one hundred and twenty degrees, you can see what looks like a soaring eagle, almost like he's grabbing a fish out of the water. And like wings here, mm -hmm. head over this way. Right. Yeah. But the uh, the pillars are they'll always be the most famous. Now I know that you've done in the past that you've had some longer process image of, of the eagle. Can you share with us uh, some of your older images of the eagle nebula? Sure. In the pillar, because this is one of my favorites. So I'm really excited that I get to see one of my favorite objects for the first time this year. It, it is cute. Yeah, yeah. I did actually at the uh, at the. What would what they do? Um, the, the telethon. Mm -hmm. uh, I previewed these, but it's first time they've been in the star party. Yeah. And I'm having to, trouble doing one thing at a time here, so bear with me. Oh, take your time with it. So I'm going to be going through, and um, I just answer a couple questions that are already going on in the 
comments with the event page and also maybe help with future Hangouts. Yes, typically if you are looking at the event page on Google Plus on a desktop browser or laptop, it's going to change your time zone for you. But if you're doing it mobile, it's going to show you the the original time that it was posted. So I made it here in Los Angeles in Pacific time. So if you are in New Zealand, for instance, and you're mobile reading Google Plus, it's going to say 9 p.m. Pacific, which doesn't really help you. But because Pacific time rocks. It does. I have to say, even though I'm originally from Eastern, I have to say Pacific's been pretty nice mm-hmm. so far. And yes, I'm seeing a whole lot of awesome comments and some requests. So yeah, we'll see polar line. Oh, Stu, you're polar lined. And are you getting dark enough? No. I, I am now polar lined. I am now going to start my focusing routine. So oh we're God. we're close. Great. So I'm going to pull up over to Corey's image as he has gone off to stack some more. So this is the star Seder in Cygnus. Um, it's right off the camera he just took. And so he, he, as we see the beautiful, the diffraction spikes is what they're called. So the little, what we typically see in movies, the, the quintessential shimmering star. Well, what that is, it's a diffraction spike. So we actually put a crosshair in front of the the camera, which the light actually bends around it, and you're homemade. able to see those lines. It's yeah, everything Corey does is homemade. I think he made his CCD at home. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's how he does it. Actually, he did modify his first camera by himself, but he got a second one um, professionally modified. Professionally modified? Was, yeah, because he was afraid to do it. Have no fear, Corey. In the future, you can keep doing it. But that's a four-minute exposure right there for uh, for Seder and Cygnus, which I'm just loving the the way that the colors are going on there, even with the diffraction and coming off with that great field of view. Oh, there we go, Gary. Yeah, this is um, this is one I did. It's been over a year now. Okay. But it, it's done with narrow band filters, so it's hydrogen alpha. Sulfur two and oxygen three, and the mapping on this one is the hydrogen is red, sulfur is uh, green, and the oxygen is blue. It's also at full res, so I can do things like this and bring it way in. Oh wow! But this was taken from here, and it's about an hour exposure at each one of the filters. For each one of them, and that, was that taking in in your backyard, or was that yes. at a darker site? No, if, when I get to dark locations, I try to shoot real color. Okay. Because that gives me the chance to do that. But anything I do here is going to be going to be that. I've also got a second one here. Where'd it go? Those are both tips. Where's the... Maybe I don't have a JPEG of that one that's mapped differently. No, that's not going to show up. Anyway, that's the, uh, the false color. And it's done from here, but it's kind of nice to be able to look at all the stuff, look at the pillars sitting here, and the bubbles. Right, no, absolutely. Intricate it, pieces going on here. So this is what you can do in a light polluted area. Yes. So yeah, we, we are in Los Angeles County. So uh, horrible, horrible light pollution, but if you have the correct filters, you can actually block out a lot of that light and really be able to to observe and image some really amazing things like the pillar cre- pillars of creation. You said you used three different filters. You said O3, H alpha, yeah. and what? Sulfur two, hi- um, sulfur two, hydrogen, sulfur two, hydrogen alpha, and oxygen three. And oxygen three. And so, you know, what we're looking at here is the the difference. He's able to block out everything except for the light that comes from these molecules that are excited at this very particular wavelength, the small little band of wavelengths coming through. So he's absor- you know, being able to capture these images and then do a composite by stacking them on top of one another to pull out different colors. And he's doing a, what's called a false color because since it is very, very particular in what's up there, you get to attribute whatever color you want to those specific wavelengths coming in. Yeah, and this... Um also shows something that with the false colors in the three different pictures, if I zoom way in, you can see there's not a perfect alignment on the stars. 
and okay. that happened because you know some of the filters are letting more of the light through the star. The star's a little bigger on some filters than others, so you can never get an exact match. But out to here, in the full resolution, it doesn't make much of a difference. Right. So I, let me pop up something else here. Yeah, I, I, I think we have something else for you to, to do. Maybe you can, um, in the next round for our, our photo contest, we might have to have you, I might have to request you put a submission in for the pillars. Sure. Okay, and this is uh, the Lagoon. Nice. Uh, that is, again, is two minutes at a uh, six, 60, excuse me, 60 seconds at a two by two because the area here was bright enough that if I take it much longer, it's going to get blown out. Right. But this is the famous Lagoon Nebula and Hydrogen Alpha. So this is in Sagittarius, right? Uh, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> so we, we went from Messier's 16th to Messier's 8th object. And they're very and, close. Yep. And it's something that actually you can see with binoculars, since you, you, know, you have such a a big field of view, but it's something that you can that I could have with my binoculars, which are in my trunk right now, because I was using them in in a, at a dark sky site last week. But it's it's amazing what you can what you can image with the wide variety. I mean, even in our show tonight, we have a, a wide variety of different types of telescopes, but and we're able to pull out different things. And I really love what you're able to pull out, Gary. But we Wait also know Stuart no and. Hide. That's Holy. not the lagoon, that's the swan. Hey, I, I, I just found a power tip. If you're trying to focus the telescope, make sure you take off the lens cap. I, I hear that helps. Yeah, get, that really you helps. Really, really focus that way. It's like, it's like <laughs> why am I not getting anything? <laughs> oh, was that Mike? I think Mike, I was, oh, and he popped out. So when I was talking about being at the, the dark sky side, I was actually with Mike Chasen that just jumped in the hangout. Hopefully he can come back and he can share some of his images from the dark sky site. And Gary, you said you were being a liar? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. that's the swan. I'm looking at my list and I got them out of order. That uh, is I don't swan. know if I can trust you anymore. No, I wouldn't. Oh, I'd never well. trust somebody like me. <laughs> okay, let's see if I can get some more going here. And we're still waiting for Corey. And you said, Stu, you remembered your lens cap this time? Yeah, now the lens cap's off, so I'm I'm good. Now I've got I'm just using my Botanoff mask to focus. Okay. So. Oh, it looks like Corey's back here too, getting some images loaded onto his computer. Yeah. Nice. Um, I did see okay. Vance okay. McCauley yeah. asked for M57. Uh, yeah, Vance. I believe Corey said that in our back channel he should be able to get it. It, it might be a little small, but we'll try to get M57 in there for you. I can zoom on it, so that shouldn't be a big problem. And big and Yes. Yes. In big and sorry, sorry, wrong word. Um, I've got El, I've got Alberio or Albereo. How do you pronounce that, Scott? Is there uh, Alberio? Or at least that's how I pronounce it. So. Well, then it's right. That's how it is. Um. Yes. So you have Alberio coming up? Yes, I do. Okay, M57. They wanted. Yeah, Vance McCauley. What Are you doing that one, Stuart? Uh, I can. What is it? What is it? The ring. Yeah. yeah. It's just M57. Is it, a cl is it a cluster or is it a nebula? No, it's a planetary nebula. Planetary nebula. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, and, oh, 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 of course. Yeah, dumbbell. Um, exactly. What? Yeah. <laughs> Duh. Um, I might be a little low for me. I'll, I'll see. There you go, Scott. I've got Alberio up. Oh, very nice. And, that, um, and you're using your... Uh, your diffraction. Yeah, your I can homemade. make it. So I'll show you the full. Oops. Um, this oh, is no, the field of view of my scope. Okay. And then this is the homemade diffraction spike maker. What I can do with it. Oops. And, and what exactly is your homemade diffraction? Well, it's a it's it's a uh, it's a cereal box cardboard ring. Ooh. Holds on uh, picture hanging wire in a. Uh, Crosshair pattern across the main objective objective of the scope, and uh, that that's it. Basically, just impersonates a uh, like a secondary mirror spider on right. a new or something else. So, because you're you're using a refracting telescope now, yeah. Yes, yeah, I'm using a 80 millimeter APO refractor. So, 
Do you have a picture of that too? Because I, I don't know. I think I've seen it once or twice. Oh, it's the line. Ring Nebula. Not Dumbbell. Dumbbell. I was calling you a Dumbbell, Stuart. Oh, yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> got it. All right, no, it's the Ring Nebula. Okay, yeah, I got it. Let me just let me just get a good get image of it. Yeah, Scott, I'll get an image of my scope if you'd like. Yeah, that'd be great. And so we can also show off, because I know every time we, we get a lot of, of questions about the different scopes that are coming out So or in the, in the show tonight. So Corey... Stuart and Gary all have different types of scopes with different cameras as well that are able to pull out different uh, field of views and, and imaging and filters. That yeah, my, mine, is, mine is actually very similar to um, Corey's. It's just a little bigger. Um, he's got an 80, I've got a 140 millimeter, but they're both apochromatic refractors. And so um, he and I will be able to pull out more or less the same stuff. Mine will just be a little bigger than his because my uh, field of view is smaller. Right. Um, Gary's is the one with a completely different optical system. Yeah. And what is yours, your system, Gary? Uh, it's 14 inch. Uh, Celestron, in fact, you can see it right here. Pop that guy over to here. There it is in action. There we go. It's a and, it's a it's a big beast. Yeah, the camera's I, up here. And I mean, I, I've I've seen it in person, and it's even bigger than what it looked like in the in the video that Google made for us for the VSP. But yeah, it's 14 inch diameter, and you also have on what's that uh, piggybacking on top of there? Uh, that's my guide scope. Your guide scope. That's the Orion short tube 80, the 80 millimeter refractor. And I've got the guide camera on the back. So when I'm shooting anything, I can really do a two minute exposure without guiding. But when I get into the 10, 15 minute exposures, I turn the guider on and it makes a big difference. And so that's helping you when you are doing those long exposures to keep everything exactly where they're supposed to be instead of drifting? It, yeah. Yeah, the camera on the back goes to uh, a different piece of software, and I'll pick out a star in its field and say, follow that star. And uh, I usually take about a two-second exposure with that. So every two seconds, it'll make just a minute adjustment to the telescope. Because no matter how good the mechanics are, they'll never track perfectly. Right. So that's constantly going in and kicking it just a little bit one way or the other to keep it lined up. And that's, and that's how we're able to get those great, you know, those hour-long exposures that you were showing there, just by following one particular star. You have the the big, you have the big drive on there. That's being being able to do a lot of the slewing, but this gets a very small action to make sure everything stays exactly where it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And so we have Corey's showing up here, a little bit different, actually quite a bit different than Gary's. And I don't know if Corey's still at his computer. Yes. I oh, there you are. So it's with the, all the tangles of wires going on there, too. What you doing? Yeah, well, uh, it's the way I've got it wired up is that it's always ready to go. It's in my garage on wheels. Nice. And so um, I can just wheel it out, and in about 45 minutes or so, after I get done aligning and hooking things up, um, I can be imaging. Um, and so the wires are for camera power, the guide scope on the top, um, scope power, USB cables. So I just plug in two USB cables and plug in one power, and then I'm good to go. I'm nice. actually running, doing all the imaging off a little 7-inch netbook <laughs> that just hangs out with the thing all the time. So it's ready to go. And it's already balanced. I just I leave everything connected to the camera on the scope, everything, all the time. So... So are we not going to be able to see uh, you use your DAB in action anymore? Um, I'm actually going to tear it apart and rebuild it into an astrograph um, that I hope to make light enough that I can use this mount. Okay. Or, uh, I'm not sure if that will happen or not, but I'm going to try at least. So that's going to be in pieces soon. So for our viewers, what's an astrograph? Uh, it's just an imaging telescope, a Newtonian imaging telescope. I don't know the exact uh, definition of it, but every astrograph telescope I've seen has been a Newtonian or um, hybrid of that. So. Okay. Very good. And do you have a picture of yours, Stu? Um, not handy. I can get it a little bit. Let me. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to get an a image of an actual image. 
for everybody first, so well, we'll, almost there. Very good. Well, we'll head over to Gary and see what Gary's got for well, us. Well, this is an example of when you try to shoot things that aren't quite above the trees yet. <laughs> <laughs> this this is the tree. That's why the exposure's way off. All right. Um, that's the Lagoon Nebula. In a few minutes, it'll probably clear the trees, and and we can get it. But uh, can't quite, not quite getting past that tree. So I thought I would show that, although I do have uh, another one right here that you should recognize. Right. Come on. I should do a lot of things, Scary. Pop up. There we go. There's our friendly neighborhood ring nebula. There we go. So In, in a second, I'll get a color of that. I'm just... Uh... Stretching it real quick. So with your field of view being so big, what did you have to do to change to be able to get that image coming up for you? Um, you for, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you're asking. So you know, since you have such a large field of view, and the mm -hmm. ring nebula is actually pretty small, you know, that's why we're able to get a lot with the refracting coming through. What, what did you have to do as far as binning? Just no. This is no binning. No binning. So it's at full resolution. Okay. Of Three thousand by two thousand. Eight. It's an eight megapixel camera. But okay. What I did is by no binning, I leave room that I can zoom in. And get that detail in there. Right. See, as I start to go here, you can start to see it pixelate. Right. So th this is the actual the size of my pixels in the scope. So that's the smallest thing I can. I can image, uh, but there's the whole field of view. So this is a real good one for a, uh, a much longer focal length uh, telescope. Right. It's so like an astrograph. Yes. So what the, the Ring Nebula is, that's M57, so that one there's for Vance. Uh, Vance is out of Texas, I believe. He's, he's been, at least he's tried to be in our virtual star parties. We've been trying to do some tech work and getting him in, but a uh, really nice guy. Um, but this is in Lyra, I believe, the Ring Nebula is. And, you know, it's just, it's got uh, the red giant star in there, and it's just it's going through its evolution, it's starting to become a white dwarf, since it is a, a planetary nebula just sloughing off its, uh, its matter as it's going through the, the final stage of its stellar evolution after it's, it's died. Any more requests out there? Let's take a look. Pulling up a few. Yes, James Haney. J.J. Abrams did use Corey's device for all the lens flares. So, mm -hmm. um, and he did same thing serial box and some hanging wires. Let's pull this up. Lots of, lots of great comments about yes, we're getting lots of stars, which is true. That's what we're here for. I'm seeing one for NGC 6543. Not sure off the top of my head what that is. Do you guys know? Looking right now. The cat's eye? Which is in Draco. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the cat's eye. Yeah, I can do that, too. Awesome. And that was from Tom McVeigh. So yes, Tom, we will try to get that up here for you momentarily. And how you doing over there, Stu? Getting everything working? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, 20 more seconds, I'll have something for you. Maybe uh, a little I'll, count. I'll count. Uh, no, mm -hmm. don't do that. You're going to make no? me nervous. No pressure. It's, no uh, pressure. Yeah. <laughs> Very, Gary, the problem is actually Gary's VSP display program is in my way. So. Gary? Are you are you trying to get some friendly competition and just weasel everyone out? It's just, it's uh, just the way I it's say? set up. It's what uh, can I say? <laughs> a little Doctor Evil in there somewhere. Hey, you need a little Doctor Evil in there. <laughs> and and for those of you who are watching, not you know, if you guys are watching on on YouTube through you know through Twitter or Facebook or through shares out there. If you want to go to the event page, uh, I'm seeing right now Kevin Franklin is putting up some amazing photos, which I, I'm hoping, I'm thinking that they're they're his, but here's some of the moon, but also M83 and some other ones there. So if, 
you also want, and something that's been going on a lot in the past, that if you would like to share your own images that you've taken uh, from from your backyard or in, you know either now or in the past, feel, please feel free to join up into the event page, share the the image going on on what is, and if you can use or tell us what optics you've used or what camera, that'd be great too to show that it takes all different types of, of optics and cameras and mounts and everything like that to be able to do astrophotography, that you don't have one perfect type of scope. You have all sorts of different types. Oh, Gary, that, I mean, Corey, that's what I'm doing, too. Oh, he says he's doing M27. That's yep. uh, that's just what I started as well. So we'll be able to see the difference between Gary's and mine, I mean, with Corey's and mine. And the, the difference in your diameter is, what, 40? Millimeters? Some, uh, something like that, yeah. He's yeah. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 60. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. He's 80, I'm 140. So. Okay. So, so, and I have, I actually have a color um, ring there. Do you see it? Oh, very nice. Yeah. So we can compare it over here with Gary's, which is only in hydrogen alpha light right. coming through. And then moving over into Stuart. And what, Stuart, you're just, are you using the modified DSLR? This is the modified DSLR, right. And, um, see some dust bunnies in the in the picture there but um, yeah so this is a 60 second at ISO 800 is it 60 seconds yeah this is a 60 second at ISO 800 Great. I would love how you're able to see the difference in the reds and the blues there yeah. coming out yeah and with just a quick color balance in um, uh, in Photoshop just to make sure that I had it had it right that's a great object in color yeah oh, it's very beautiful and it's, it's something that you know, it's always a great request to come out there. And it's something that no matter how many times we, we see it, it's, to, at least for me, I think it's an absolutely beautiful object that I always get excited seeing that, especially, you know, being able to take some really nice photos of it. Because some of the processing that's able to get done with it, it's, it comes out fantastic. And let's see here. Corey says, yep, M27 is going to be coming up for him with a dumbbell. And I'm looking at the comments here. I'm seeing a request for NGC6888. That would be cool. From Jeff Stetzer. Or Jeff Stetzer. So I'll put that in there, and I'll see if that's going to be up here for us. And also just take a look at anything else. From any of our requests going through. Now, with it being so hot out here, because I know it's been a concern for a lot of people, but Gary, have you had to do anything special with your telescope? Because it was, it was 100, 104 out by you today? Yeah. It was, it was 110 Fahrenheit, um, so it was 43 Celsius for me today. I didn't have anything, didn't do anything special. Um, I opened the dome a little bit just so it wouldn't cook in there, although I've got some solar fans running it. And then I, uh, I've i got a little air conditioning unit out there, so about uh, 6 o'clock, once the sun started to go down a little bit, I turned that on for a while. So that'll give me a pre-cooling. Okay. Because uh, uh, Roy Salisbury was, when we were talking with him today, see if he was joining, it's so hot out there in Las Vegas, and it's something you have to really, you know, have some sensitive technical equipment, you don't want to bake it. And can end up being a really bad day if you're having some really hot gadgets that are not working properly with the big heat wave coming through. Yeah. Um, okay, I have the cat's eye, but I can't image it. It just looks like a slightly large star. Okay. Um, I, I might be able to. I'll try. Yeah. All right. What's the number of it again? Uh, NGC, where'd I write it? Where'd I write it? 6543. 6543. Okay. Uh, looks, and Tom uh, Nath, he's one of our astronomers as well. He ended up getting clouded out, even though it was looking like he was going to be clear to join us tonight. So hopefully your Portland weather will clear up for next week, Tom, and we'll be able to have you in. And you're pulling up something soon here, Corey? Yeah, if my SD card works. Um, I've got NGC 6888 from last night, um, but the only way it looks good is with a stack, and I don't know if you want to see that. So. Okay. Um. 
I see James Haney is uh, is asking us too. Is like with you know with the high heat with greater radiational cooling, does it cause any greater interference with with imaging? Oh, you know, I didn't even I was I didn't even go out last night because it was so hot. It's, it was it's this the it was just going to be so awful with the heat that I just didn't I just totally didn't bother. You know, just the thermal noise would have just been too much. Right. So and I mean. He, what even as it even is now, it's still hot. You know, when you know when the ambient temperature is hotter than you know it's ninety. It was ninety five degrees last night. Mm -hmm. So yeah, well, what's going on is you have these molecules, and you when you add energy when you're heating them up, they're bouncing around even more. So you're causing a lot. You know, it, when they're moving around, they're going to be hitting and moving around, and the light coming through as well. You're just causing a lot of a lot of issues. That's why you're able to see the the, the little waves coming up from, from the hot asphalt because things are moving. I'm sorry, cat's eye was six five four three. You said? Yes. Yes. Okay. And pulling up a couple more of our getting a lot of really great uh, comments going on here with the event page and on YouTube. So thank you for keeping up the conversation in there, guys. Yes, I wish you could see the Hourglass Nebula. I got it. Did you? It's right there. Th there we go. You're not there paying attention. I I'm reading comments. I'm oh, being well. a good host and producer. <laughs> <laughs> Corey, do you have yours? Y yeah, if I can get my computer to recognize my SD card. Uh, so better. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dedicate this one to um, Brian Lefkowitz because he did request this, uh, even though I just read it, but it was his birthday yesterday. So happy birthday, Brian. He's one of our fans that are always out there watching every single week when we're on air. So we appreciate your support and sure. hope you had a great birthday. Now, what, what did you do to get this image there, Stuart? Oh, this was still, this is 60 seconds, um, ISO 800. Um, my, I, my sky glow is still kind of light out, so if I try to go much longer, it just, it just completely washes out. So um, what I did is I did 60 seconds, ISO 800, did a, a quick color correction, um, I moved it over to Photoshop, just moved the dark, the dark point over just so it's not all washed out. Mm -hmm. Stretched it and did a quick noise reduction and boom. So and boom. Yeah. Boom goes the dynamite. Yeah. So um, uh, you know, it's it's this is sort of what you would see in in an eyepiece. Not quite this big, but right. It'd be more or less like this. So this is another planetary nebula, uh, it's in the constellation Volpecula, I believe. And it's around 1,300, 13 to 1,400 light years away from us. And so we're talking about those planetary nebula. They, you know, it's essentially what's going to be happening to our star once it goes through its final phases after it's red dwarf and it's no longer able to fuse those heavier elements. It's going to end up sloughing off its its material into space and eventually becoming a white dwarf. And I hear a train. Yeah, that's. Uh... There's a train track near my house. Okay, I got the cat's eye, but nobody's going to like it. So um, you can take my word for it. It's like Gary. It just looks like a big white smudge. Big white yeah. smudge? Yeah. Um, so I can post it if you want, but it's just a big white smudge. Yeah, or you can put it into the event page, too, if you don't feel it's worthy yeah. for television. Well, you know, I, I mean, I, I could show what a big white smudge looks like if you like. Hey, it's, it's right there. So, so could I. Yeah, okay. So what do you have first, Gary? Uh, this is a piece of the North American Nebula. I'm trying to move around to other parts of it. Uh, I rotated it this way because, uh, first of all, I've got a very wide field of view. I'm covering a degree by a degree and a half of the sky. And it would take probably eight exposures of the North American Nebula to get it all in one frame. Right. But this is the uh, Gulf of Mexico area of the North American Nebula, with this down here being Mexico coming up California up in here and then over here to Florida and I'm trying to move this to the right a little bit to see if we can get that Florida area right now so uh, that's always a fun one to uh, to image well isn't that one of your big projects it's in there yes it's um, in there I'm not sure I've really done any major progress on it but it's it's in the list 
hey, you know, as long as you have it in the list somewhere, that, that means it's, it's, it's being done. Yeah. It's, it's in the process. I've seen a little bit of what what you've been able to do and pull out of it, and it's, been, it's looked great. So I really can't wait for that to come out. I, I think maybe what we can do too, if you ever do finish, if we can get some collaboration with our astronomers, and we can actually make a map of North America with where each of the astronomers in the VSP are at. I think that'd be kind of cool. Well, that'd be fun. I I did that a while back, actually. Oh, yours is better than mine. I did that a while back. Um, and it's somewhere on my Google Plus page. I never updated it, though. <laughs> yeah. So what did you do, Corey, that's different than me besides just doing a better job? Uh, it's 100 Maybe. What's that? It's 180 seconds. Oh, that's why. Oh, there you go. Yeah, okay. But a boom. That's what dark skies will get you. Oh, yeah. So it's a 180-second ISO 800. So this is even with, you know, with Corey having a, a smaller scope. He was able to to get a little bit more. What's up? I'm gonna get something new. All right, I'll let you. All right, th this there's the cat. I got the cat's eye there. You can see the white smudge. Um. Oh, it's it's, it's white, but it's I don't. I see a little bit of a greenish uh, hue. An albino God. cat with. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Never mind. Yeah. So let me see if what what people are looking for. Okay, so let me share this image out real quick with screen share. So what what the at least the request was was something like this. A little bit different than what Stu is sharing, but a little bit. <laughs> a little bit different. But I, I'm fairly certain this is going to be taken with something a little bit more than a refractor um, in, Su in San Francisco. So, hold it up. So, yeah, seeing the difference there with, with Stu's just shows that, you know, we have different types of telescopes and different types of cameras for, different, for imaging different things for science and everything like that. And, again, this is Corey's view of, of the dumbbell coming up. And you can just see it's it's better than mine because he got three times as much data than than I did. So, right. it just so, sort of shows you why longer exposures give you better, you know, uh, better pictures. Unless you're doing it at the moon and then you just get blown out because there's so much. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, until you get limited by the sky glow. The sky glow. Um, yeah, I moved uh, over to the Florida area. Okay. You can kind of see here's where we're looking at uh, Mexico. Here's the Gulf. Here's kind of Florida. And right here you can see part of the Pelican Nebula, which I'm moving up to right now. Very good. So this is where we're seeing David Dickinson's area. And we're also having Michael Phillips and Mitchell Duke a little bit further north than him. <laughs> And you, you said you have such a large field of view, but what what is the the area of the sky that North American Nebula takes up? I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I could look. Well, I could look too. I thought this is your project, Gary. I'm. Come on. Yeah, I'm sorry. I uh, I failed. I'll it's go all back. right. It's okay. Set me back a grade. <laughs> Let's see here if I can find that while we're waiting for some more images to come in from everyone, and I'll be also reading through some of the comments as well. I'm I'm working on uh, doing a double star here. Oh, very good. Love love the uh, double star. Something coming. different. Which ones you pull out? I'm gonna just do Mizar and Alcor. Okay. So. I'm just trying to see. I'm just trying to bring out. I, I got Alco and Mizar easily. I'm just trying to bring out the double in, in Mizar because it's um, uh, uh, it's pretty bright. It okay. is pretty bright. Let's see what I can do with this. Yeah, let's see here. So reading through a lot of these comments, and yes. Yes, Brian, I, I, I will someday move to Europe already with my Celsius, with my amazing, amazing metric units that I use all the time. 
I have to, I'm finding myself now having to convert back to Fahrenheit because I forget <laughs> what in Fahrenheit it is. So go metric, boo for the English units. Corey gives me crap about that all the time, actually. Yay, yay science. Boo science for measuring wolf. based off of the foot of a dead man. The bums always lose. <laughs> all right, so is, Stuart, you're pulling up a double star. Yeah, Corey, what are you going to be pulling up? He's, he's working on M13, he said. Oh, M13. And Gary's moving around. Yeah, we're going at a pretty quick pace because, you know, Fraser's not here. I'm like, let's, let's get into gear. Because, you know me, I'm always right on task and never messing around. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. I'm, I'm serious business all the time. Yeah, you are. I don't know how we stand it. I, I don't know. I as, a, as James Haney just put, Scott can be a harsh headmaster. It's true. I, I'm, I'm very mean. I'm a really, I'm the bad host, and we'll just yell at people incessantly because I can. So I'm going through trying to check also Twitter and Facebook as well. Things are going on. So those for everyone as well here on Google Plus and YouTube, we have started pages over on Twitter and on Facebook. So on, um, on Twitter, you can follow us at the underscore VSP. And I'll be trying to update that as we're going along, especially any other um, like photo contests that we've done, any special events. We'll be going up there via Twitter. So give us a, a follow, tweet us. I will make sure that we at least try to get back to you with that. And also on, on Facebook, we have a page set up for it. So give us a like. I do share up the events on there. Um, and please feel free to, to put up any pictures that you've taken as well on, on Facebook. We're trying to uh, make sure everybody has the ability to to be able to interact with the virtual start party, um, no matter what social media you're on. Even though we're on Google+, Plus and we love Google+, Plus over here, so it really allows us to do that. We understand that not everyone is, is here yet. OK, and I got something new. Very good. What do you have, Gary? This is the Pelican Nebula. And right here on this side is the east coast of North America. So it gives you perspective on where this is. Right down in this area is Florida. Uh, but you can see there's the eye. And the pelican's mouth beak comes down this way in the back of his head like that. Okay. Why it's called that. I also, if we do this one more time, we can also say it's the rabbit. Because this is the nose and the mouth of the rabbit, and that's its ears. <laughs> and I think Pamela was the one that first pointed that out when we when we imaged it. It's the rabbit. So it's a pelican, and so we have a bird and a mammal. Right. Can you see the pelican, but can you see the rabbit? Trying to see the rabbit. So this, if, if you could see this with your naked eye, it'd probably be eight, nine moons across. Right. Very, very big. And I'm muting Stuart. All right, there we go. Sorry, Stu. You're scratching your mic. Yeah, so where, where is the, the, the ears at? This would be the ears back here. So, oh, um, okay. I'm going to pull into coal. No. Oh, I see it. I and the ears sticking I see back it now. this way. Okay, very good. So, could be either one. It's whatever it is. It's an awfully big one. It is very big. So you said eight moons across. About that. Let me look. See if I can figure out the size of it. So I've pretty much gone through my list, and I'm going to have to start looking for other things here. So, and this is where you are, right, right next to the North American Nebula. So, I guess off the east coast of North America is where exactly. we're seeing this object. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah, it's laid it over. Uh, it's by um, Deneb, isn't it? Uh, it is uh, next to Cygnus. Um, yeah, I think it's in Cygnus. Okay. So by the start, right, yeah. right off the um, top star of the Northern Cross in Cygnus. Okay. Yep. And it's really a huge, huge area. Uh, fact, let me see if I can do this. I bet you I can do that. Let me see. Let's see here. Pulling this up here, so this is going to be one of the the emission nebulas that are is going on. 
And so, yeah, it does resemble the, the look of a pelican, or now as we're seeing a rabbit, or as I've seen, uh, going on here. But, um, yeah, the, the neighbor there is there with the North American uh, nebula. And just and it's the molecular cloud, it's just got this dust that's really allowing to emit the light out there. Yeah, for, for some reason, it's not liking me to share this screen. That's better. Okay, I'm blinking yep. a bit. But this, um, this is the North American Nebula here. Um, this is the Pelican. And if you can you see that purple square right here? I can. I'm not sure if our viewer is going to be able to since the, the resolution. But so, so right here where I'm outlining it, that's the field of view of my scope. Okay. So I'd probably need to go to get the whole thing. I'd need to go probably four this way and another four over here and another four over here. Probably take 12 exposures to get, get it decent. Okay, very good. And my exposure is about three moons across would fit in lengthwise on my exposure. Wow, that's huge. So it's a very, very big thing there. Well, I'm seeing here that Stuart has something up. Yeah, this is um, this is Alcor and Mizor. The Mizor is the bright one, and if you look, if you cross your eyes um, and look carefully, you can see that Mizor itself is a double. Um, and so Mizar is on the bottom, Alcor is on the top, and uh, Mizar itself is a double um, that okay. is a telescopic double. You can't um, uh, you can't see it in the um, uh, with naked eye. Right. So it's something you will have to actually get the angular resolution. Exactly. To be able to see it that way. So where's this at? Uh, this is uh, in the Big Dipper. Oh, okay. So Ursa Major? Mm, yeah, Big Dipper. The Big Dipper, or Ursa Major. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, Corey looks like he's got something really pretty with lots of spikes. Yeah, I'm going to pull over that. What do you have there, Corey? I think I know what this is. This is uh, M39, an open cluster. Uh, I'm not exactly sure which constellation it technically is in. Okay. Um, but, oh yeah, it says there in the file name, you can see. <laughs> uh, this is 180 second ISO 800 exposure. Um, I am, uh, it's just below, it's like in between Cygnus and Cepheus somewhere, right. so. So, yeah. Um, M39 there, that, the open cluster out in that area. Yeah. If, if uh, my transparency in the sky was better, uh, you'd be able to see a little bit of nebulosity somewhere around there, but it's just not happening tonight. So. Well, um, right I guess now, I'll forgive you, I suppose. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, you can't ship me a laser, so you're going to have to. You know, I, I might. Yeah. So this is a Messier's 39th object, and it's about 800 light yep. years away from us. Which is really close, you know. When when it comes down to that, it is really really close uh, on the cosmic scale. And I pull this up here. I, I love I love being able to see here with uh, your field of view, but also the the color coming out of it, Corey. Yeah, there's a on those two stars right there. It's a good example of the color. Right. Very, very good. And seeing some questions here about your telescopes coming out. Uh, let's see, how do the guys feel about using the AR-102 refractor for astrophotography with a 0.8x field flattener? Uh, I don't have an AR-102. What is um, that's a, I assume that's a, is that an APO refractor? I will take a look. And this is from Wayne W. So, see what scientific, explore scientific AR-102 is what is coming up first for me. And looks like achromatic, yep. Achromatic or APO? I would say achromatic is what I'm finding. Oh. So maybe we can get to, to that yeah, question later on. Yeah, 
sure not. But uh, what do we mean here? That sounds like a lot of jargon. So, so what would be a field flattener? So for so, for our audience out there, yeah. what is a field flattener? All right. Well, for, for, um, what a field flattener does is on a um, refractor scope on the edges, you can get some. It'll get some stretching, especially in um, an achromatic. Um, uh, refractor because of um, the type of glass that it is and so what the what the field flattener will do is it flattens the field and basically change it fixes the optics so that um, it, you don't get the stretching along the uh, along the edges that's more or less um, uh, what it does um, there's a couple ways to kind of go around that stretching I do it by cropping I a field flattener for my scope costs about uh, $700, then I just don't feel like spending and I don't really notice it that much. Um, if you have a, lar a larger format CCD camera, um, uh, then it becomes more important. Since I have a, a DSLR, the edges of my field of view are cropped anyway because of what my chip is, so it doesn't really matter all that much to me. Um, so it kind of depends on his camera that he's using right. um, and what he wants to take pictures of. You know, so let's say if he wants to do mostly planetary stuff, you don't need a field flattener for it. Mm -hmm. um, if you're trying to do, you know, large, wide vistas of stars, then sometimes, yeah, it might be, might be helpful. Right. And um, I, I think yeah. it also plays into the, the, the idea, too, that we, there are so many different types of things that you can do when it comes to astrophotography and telescopes and the different cameras and different add-ons, the different filters and things like that you might need to use. It really depends on what you're trying to do in the first place. Yeah, I have one of my favorite objects up now. I don't know if you can see it. You are um, up right now. This is the double double um, uh, um, in uh, Lyra. It's a double star, but it's a double double star. So you can see, if you just look at it with a small, in, under small um, magnification, all you see is a double star. But with large magnification, each double um, resolves into two separate double stars. So you can see the two double stars that are right next to each other there. So in, let me see here, which one? So I see the really bright one coming out there the, in the double-double. So yes. right, right, I guess, south of it on the, on the screen. Yeah, Epsilon Lyra. It's, epsilon um, Lyra. Yeah. yeah, it's this Epsilon Lyra. It's, so it's just kind of on, I think it's the opposite of the, where the Ring Nebula is, if I okay. remember correctly. And let me see. And actually, it looks like it's something that also viewed through binoculars. You might be able to see it as well to find out. But not not to the point where you're able to see that it's each one of those is a double star in number themselves. All right, and I'm gonna pull this up here because we've got about five to seven minutes left here in the show. So I'm Corey's got M13. Hop over to Corey. Yeah. yeah. And what do you have for us, Corey? Oh yeah, this is M13. It's a uh, 120 second um, ISO 1600. I had to do a meridian flip in order to get this one, so I uh, had to turn off my auto guider. So this is unguided, um, and yeah, I mean, it's the biggest uh, globular cluster we can see in the northern hemisphere. Right, and and actually, this was a request I'm trying to find out who requested this earlier, but we're we're trying to get as many requests going on here tonight, and the 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 great uh, cluster in Hercules. The globular cluster. Pull this up here. Um, just getting everything out. So it's around 300,000 stars. If it's, I'm trying to put my, my fact sheets on here for it, but I believe it's 300,000 stars. I mean, it's a lot of stars. So we think about our sun being one. Well, 300,000 of them coming out, and it's in the constellation Hercules out there. Um, but it was it was discovered by Edmund Halley. So the, the same one that we have Halley's comet. We have, also have there in 1714 is when it was originally discovered. Which you think they've they've seen it for a while. You know, it's pretty. It's it's gorgeous. I mean, as we can see there. But I wonder, because what's your field of view that you're looking at right now, Corey? 
Um, actual like arc second size yeah. or whatever. I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, I feel bad. For I feel, I feel yeah, I feel you. bad about that, but it's that right there. <laughs> is that right? Oh, it's great. I can what, whatever see. that is. Someone else go ahead and calculate. It. Somebody calculate it for me. Uh, no, no Stellarium. Uh, Stellarium says my field of view is kind of somewhere around. Oh, I want to say one and a half, little under one and a half degrees. Okay. Very good. Well, I just tried to do M81, but it's behind my house, so that's not Well, gonna I know you can fix that. Yeah. I, I would recommend Blow moving more than blowing up your house, but you can do something about that. Now, Gary's got something new for us. What do you have for us, Gary? Well, you got the Propeller Nebula. Ooh. Now, this uh, if you look at the sky layout, the summer sky is wonderful because you've got the center of the galaxy down kind of near the horizon for us, and then it stretches across to the other horizon when it's up uh, the Milky Way and there is so much nebulosity in there that you can just point anywhere you can see this is right this is the propeller here but there's just glowing hydrogen gas everywhere and this is fairly close to the North America and between them I would find gas clouds all over the place in this area so this is a propeller now is are we looking at an airplane or are we looking at a ship um, that's my question I just call it a propeller, actually. Um, propeller. Uh, let's say it's Lindbergh flying across the Atlantic from North yeah. America. Let, let's do that. Yeah, that. That could be it. And there's a propeller, and there's a little cockpit right there. And, <laughs> and uh, here's a wing. There's some, Oh, I see it. Yeah. There's another wing. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> I, I think we're, we're we can and call then, this the, the the Lindbergh Nebula going across North America. <laughs> yeah, the body going, of going across the Atlantic down here. I think we're getting kind of strange tonight. I, I think I'm kind of strange every night, so well, that, yeah. that's okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to look for any other questions coming up here because we are coming to the end of the show, uh, but we've had a lot of great comments, so thank you everyone out there for your great questions, comments, suggestions for the objects coming out. Um, let's see here. Yes, we did not say it, or I typically poke, but it is a... Is a globular cluster for Fraser <laughs> for M13. Um, and yeah, we won't be able to get to some of the other, um, to the other um, objects this week, but please come back next week to make those suggestions. So we will have our, our next show is going to be a week from tonight. So we'll be on the, the 6th of July, the 6th of July on that Sunday. And we will be gathering everyone together. I believe Fraser will be with us as well. And we will keep going. Hopefully I would hope July, the is July over by 7th. Is it July 7th? July 7th. Yes, you're yeah. right. July 7th. Yes. And, and we September. do need to wrap this up because my wife just stuck her head in and said the season premiere of Dexter is on. Uh oh. TV is taking over our TV I, show. Yeah, but I, I don't know how I feel about that. Show about a serial killer. I just can't miss that. <laughs> it's 2013, Gary. You have DVR, right? Yeah, I, yeah oh. but it's recorded. She wants to, you know, before you go to bed. So, well, you know, the, um, at least Walking Dead is over now, and yes. Game of Thrones is is now. So you know they won't com they won't compete. Well, the thing that, that I like about Dexter is you you feel like you shouldn't like the show. Yeah. This is good, but ooh, it can... well, you need to read the books. I've read the books, and I recommend oh, really? them. They're very I good. Not. I've read the books and I've watched the show, and I still like the show. It's one of those where I actually really like the show, even though I've, I'm one of those people too that are like, "Oh, it's nothing like the book." It's actually really good. I recommend it. Hmm. So we will wrap it up here. I want to thank everyone again for the comments. Um, we're going to hop over here to Corey. Thank you for joining up with us and having such a great haircut and shirt. We we match. It's kind of nice. <laughs> A dirty job, but somebody had to do it. That's right. <laughs> Gary, thank you for showing us your very big field of view and uh, showing us your your telescope from my uh, my neighbor, I guess, 15 minutes yeah, away. Pretty close. And Stuart, thank you. My pleasure. Giving us all the color. So we have, I mean, it's great, we have two refractors on one reflector, which typically the reflectings the reflecting telescopes are the, the majority, but not tonight. We have more refractors, so 
Keep it up. More refractors. I love refracting telescopes. <laughs> not, not to hate on the reflecting, but I am partial to refractors. So yes, everyone, thank you. Um, please um, share it out. I'll put out the the next event tomorrow evening, most likely, for next week's show. Uh, feel free to subscribe and like and plus one and share out everything out there so we can uh, share out the virtual star party and be able to show off the universe to everyone out there. Have a great night. Okay. Bye, everybody. All right. Good night, everyone.